Welcome in to another edition of the Players Perspective Uncensored with Larry O'Bannon. Got some wonderful guests with me today. Got my partner in crime to stop through, Al Haji Muhammad. He's on the podcast today. And our guest today is a legend, a true Louisville legend. Comes from New York City, uh, but he's adopted in the city of Louisville as one of our own. Uh, welcome in Russ Smith, a.k.a. Mr. Act Accordingly, Mr. <laughs> Get Lucky, the Bass King. Russ, man, welcome to the podcast, brother. What's up, LO? How you doing, OG? Move it up, baby. I'm, I'm, I'm good, man. I'm good. Glad to finally be able to get you on, man. Been trying to to, to kind of get with you for a minute, but they haven't been able to reach you. I didn't have your phone number, man, so I was I was able to. Uh, glad to able to uh, contact and link up with you, man, and, and get you on. It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, but l- let me start off by asking you first, man. Um, I know you're a big bourbon person. Uh, I'm a bourbon person as well. Before we start talking about your bourbon, what's a bourbon that you uh, that you like or a go-to bourbon for yourself? Oh, man, as you know, and um, obviously as a connoisseur of bourbon yourself, you know that there's many different routes you can take or go. So there's never really one... Uh, not really one choice or direct answer I could give, but right. my favorite personally, um, I'm a big fan of Willett and uh, Drew and those guys down up in uh, Barstown. And um, I like the Noah's Hill and I like the Lone's Creek and I like to kind of mix and match those. And then uh, if I want something aged, my go-to has been the Henry McKenna out of uh, Heaven Hill, uh, about a 12 year. Uh, I think that's pretty tasty. So those would be my uh, top three preferably. Um, I just went and stopped and got some more uh, different brands. So I'm trying out different brands and stuff now. But um, it's it's really it's not really any easy answer. But those those would be my top three. Facts, facts. Yeah. Henry McKenna can't go wrong with that. Willits, big time. The Willits ten yeah. year is probably one of my top two or three. Uh, I'm a big fan of that as well. Uh, I'm a big fan of Wellers. Uh, Stag Junior. Man is really you know, kind of taking over one of the top spots. I like yeah. the Willis Antique 107, but that Stag Junior, man, is, mm-hmm. is pretty tough, man. That's the red, that's the red label Wellers too. Yeah, I like yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just, so, so, so being a, a connoisseur, man, you have your own bourbon coming out. You have a lot of ventures going on, but we're going to start first talk about the, the bourbon side of your ventures. Talk about that a little bit and what you got coming out, Mr. Rusticulous. Yes, sir. So uh, the company name is uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bourbon, and we're looking to operate more more so, obviously, like a traditional Kentucky bourbon, um, well, satisfying of the palate, uh, transparency of the of the age and the distillery. But also, outside of that, I want I wanted to operate as an entertainment spirit, as a as a clothing line, as as far as branding. So I want to do some things in the industry that's uh, never been done, kind of revolutionize the industry, bring bourbon to more so the, uh, the, the entertainment side of, of things. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's been fun. Uh, so far, the, we've launched a website. I've came out with uh, teacups and mugs. Uh, I have uh, Glencairns and Snifters that sold out. I only did a, a little bit of those, but we're also working on uh, coasters and more nice material material merch items but um it's growing and i'm looking to release sometime within the next six months a lot of the majority of the business part is handled um i'm i'm under i'm doing all my business hands-on so that's going to take even more time because i have to understand my margins i have to understand my distribution right from there uh just one step at a time not trying to rush but you know, just just being patient. <laughs> nice, nice. Now, what can the people expect to taste on their palates with the Mr. Rusticulous bourbon? What I know you have a lot of different samples. I watch, I keep up with you on your social media that you're trying and that you're putting together for your bourbon. What can the people expect, the type of palates and notes that they can get from your bourbon? So uh, the first, uh, the I had a I had a three-year-old that I wanted to release. I wanted to get that out there early. And that was, that was very Candy Cornish, and buttery notes. I'm a I'm a sweets guy. Um, I like the I like the sweet the sweet notes in in my alcohol because I don't eat too much candy. So when, <laughs> I, when I'm taking in the, uh, the Noah's Mill or the Romans Creek, that's kind of what I get. So that's that's kind of like my base. So when I have my bourbon, that's kind of what I like because that's what I like to drink. Um, but I just got some more samples in. 
And I think that's more uh, a Sherry Oak cast. Um, it was aged in a wine wine barrel, so it's mm -hmm. gonna have those those, th those samples might have those notes. So I'm still battling on: Do I want to go with the, the sherry oak, or do I want to go more more sweet, more honey, more butterscotch? And I'm um, still fighting with it. But once I decide to um, pick, I'll be able to to you know. Do you, that's the good thing about bourbon whiskey: you have to disclose and you have to be transparent with everything. So once I decide and finally pick, I'll disclose everything. But um, I'm also working on a 10 to 12 year. Only problem with that one is that won't be out of Kentucky first. It's hard. I couldn't find a, a 10 to 12 year um, age here in Kentucky. So I kind of had to outsource it out of the state for now. But um, that one, those samples are coming in and I'm for sure let you know. Nice, nice. Russ, Russ, Russ. Um... We all have people that inspired us growing up. Talk to us a little, a little bit about who inspired you growing up. Man, uh, that's a good question too. Uh, uh, for me, obviously, my my dad was um, businessman. Uh, he played ball, um, and he was big in the community. He does a lot. He does so much for the community, even still to this day. Um, he's done so much work uh, with fire departments, police departments. Um, so he was for sure an inspo. Uh, my mom, her love, her, her care. Um, that's kind of, I kind of take on her personality traits um, in that regard. But outside of um, those two, I would say the, the guys who've done it before me, the, the black men who, who've done it before me, um, Damon Dash and paid my tuition since I was in second or third grade. Um, wow. He, he kind of was, he kind of really helped me. Uh, help my family, you know, get, get me through that first, you know, time period in my life. Um, I've been in Catholic school in uniform since second grade, um, watching Jay-Z do what he does in the music industry, uh, to be able to, to, to rap and be where he's from. I'm about five minutes up the block, 10 minutes up the block from where he's from to make it out, to have his own clothing line and do his liquor, do his champagne. That was truly amazing. And and then you have um, a bunch of other a bunch of other like moguls and stuff that I keep a close close eye on. I love Fifty Cent's hustle, um, how he's you know he put out three or four albums. Then he just switched, went straight to show business, got his star in Hollywood. But it's it's a it's a lot of guys' stories that's really interesting. We can't sleep on Master P. He's literally done everything. Um, from schools to food distribution to video gaming trucks to even, you know, his son, how he raised his son, Little Romeo. So, I mean, it's um, just just like a lot of those guys and the ditties of the world. That just um, only only pushes me to, to, to be better. Now, when it comes to basketball, who was somebody that you may have watched when you were younger on a basketball court that you may have wanted to – emulate your game after or sort of imitate when you're on the basketball court? Man, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hold you. Uh, hello. I, I thought I was going to be like six, seven, <laughs> six, eight. <laughs> so all my favorite players were like, uh, my favorite player of all time is McGrady, Tracy McGrady. Um, so <laughs> um, I, I, I tried to take after a whole lot of McGrady. And then, um, then it was uh, Kevin Martin for me. Um, I'm a big fan of Kevin Martin. And uh, as far as like players, my size and everything, I was love Allen Iverson, um, love Monte Ellis, and um, and as of right now, like around the time that I'm playing, it's uh, it's been Kevin Durant, it's been Russell Westbrook, and I've grown to love James Harden. So uh, it's it's um, all scorers for real. Right. <laughs> <laughs> coming now up in the mecca. Who, who in New York did you look up to? No NBA players, like, man, uh, up to New York, like, man, like, he get buckets. I want to, I want, I want to learn, yeah. learn like him. I want to be like yeah. him. It's, um, it's, man, New York, it was a lot of, it was a lot of legends in New York. So, I mean, I went to the same high school Kenny Anderson did, and uh, Kenny Smith, my coach is a legend, and, and, and um, rest in peace to him, but uh, he, he used to show me a lot of film on on Kenny, and um, that was that was a that was a guy that I I watched 
a whole lot in, in high school, but I'm an old soul. Like um, when it comes to basketball, like all of my um, tapes and inspiration kind of came from my dad in that regard. Like I have favorite players, don't get me wrong, but my inspiration on the basketball and it's like Isaiah Thomas is Terry Porter's is, you know, Joe Dumars, the Finney Johnson's and then, all of those guys back then that, that played. So um, those were Marbury. Um, Marbury's a, still a close friend of mine. Um, it's it's a lot of older players, Rob Strickland. Uh, so. It's his time, I see you, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, my dad gave me, see, I got educated pretty well. So like, those are all the cassette tapes I had. And um, But in my grade, like in my class, Still to this day, um, and I still tell the dude that I, give, I make sure I always give him his flowers when I see him. Um, he went to Florida, um, Irvin Walker. Like that was probably the most frightening person I I, I, I ever had to guard. He was uh he was always shorter than everybody, but he was always number one in the country for like ten years in New York. Buckets. He did buckets. He played there, so. yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> now coming out of New York, you were one of the top high school players, and. You chose to go to Louisville. You could have went to Big East schools. What made you choose Louisville? Um, it was the best school that I felt like I had. I think uh, at that point in time, I always felt like an underdog, and that gave me my chip. So when I got a school like that to recruit me, I was just like, I'm going to go to the biggest school, let the chips fall where they may, make contacts, um, be under Coach Patino, and just, you know, figure life out after that. I never thought... I'd be a pro or be where I'm at today because of my performance on the court here at U of L. That wasn't even in the in the cards for me. Uh, so when I was in high school, I was just like, I'm gonna just go here because it's the literally the best school. <laughs> like um, right, no right. other, no other, um, no other meaning. But if you didn't go to Louisville, where do you think you would have went to? Oh man, I saw. Yeah, um, I think for me, it would have been, it definitely would have been like a, a low, a low, a low major or mid major. But Baylor was coming after me really hard, so it could have been Baylor. Um, the coach loved me, um, and then after that, I had like uh, LaSalle, and um, I think it was like a, a Wright State. Um, but it was weird, man. It was a weird time because um, recruit. That's when. Um, rankings were were big and the five stars and rivals all those websites so um i had a lot of coaches like from arizona from florida they were like yeah you know we like you this and that but you know we're waiting on phil pressy or we're waiting on brandon knight you know like they're waiting right. on fish and that's um a lot of the situations i ran into when i got to prep school russ talk to us a little bit about um your struggles early on at Louisville, you know, with injuries and kind of being in the doghouse a little bit, kind of being in the doghouse a little bit and yeah. just the struggles. Cause uh, uh, I remember you being upset when I was in Europe. Uh, you yeah. Just, you know, <laughs> transfer and I sent you a DM like, relax. You yeah, cut that out. Really upset. <laughs> yeah, I was you know, hot. Your struggles, uh, <laughs> things like that. Cause we kind of was in the gym with you. Yeah. When you first got there. So just talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, man, dude, it was, it was hard because, um, you know, it was like my first teaspoon of, of business on the basketball end. I never really went through that. I've always played and always, like, not ran from, but um, de deferred away from having to deal with the politics because I just wanted to play. And um, when I got to school, there was, a, there was guys here that maybe, you know, were upperclassmen or may have been – more ranked or, but I felt like I was killing everybody in practice. So I deserved to play. If I'm better than you, I should play. It's that's, <laughs> that was my right. mindset going in. I never, I didn't really weigh all of the, uh, the other stuff. And um, that's where my frustration was at. And I didn't understand strategy too much. I didn't understand um, defensive tactics or um, offensive um, principles or the, the, the goal of each, that each game is different. Because, you know, you have to go – each game is a different scout. So, right. I didn't understand a lot of that. I'm just thinking, I'm better than him. I should play. <laughs> 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 we we'll figure it out later. <laughs> and um, that's that's the part where I had to, like, really, really mature. And then um, 
I even still hit some bumps in the road as a pro because of that mindset, but um, in a different way. But uh, that's what it was. And um, getting over that and um, really, I mean, you guys, the pros was coming in. So I had people to rub my, you know, ideas and feelings off of and ask questions to like you, Mo, not your, your brother would come in. Um, Dante would be there, like like guys that are playing overseas and guys that came in the leagues. Even, even guys like JR that would come on, Anton Walker, like they would be in there and I can ask those guys questions as, you know, some as what people may think about T Will, I I got to ask T Will questions. Like and that was that was huge for me. Um and then uh having um Andre Andre around, like he 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 been through it. So I was able to to talk to him. So a lot of those I think where a lot of college athletes are missing out is is the the, the kind of institution we had where all the pros came back and out in the, the underclassmen was able to just to communicate with them so and get and get some game right oh uh, how did you deal with the injuries how did you deal with the injuries the injuries that was rough um i never been injured in my life uh so i came in hurt and um once i came in hurt um i was already on the back burner and uh i just had to show everybody that I was healthy because I was just watching everybody play. And then I came off the injury, got tried to get right for maybe two or three weeks and it happened again. So I just, I really never played. Um, it was, it was, and so I was already, I was already um, behind. Um, I actually, yeah, I forgot about that. I was already behind as soon as we started the season. I couldn't learn shit, couldn't, the, the my game pace was, was thrown off. Um, but, but now, I mean, as a pro, I've been injured a whole bunch of times now and um, just keep keeping up the hard work, working to recover, understanding that it's a business, not feeling sorry for yourself. Um, a lot of those um, principles and those habits then carried on and transferred because of everything that I went through in college and how I've uh, persevered. But it's been with the help of others, man. Like, there's no me without you guys or there's no me without Fred Hina there's no me without uh Peyton C but like um a lot of those guys um helped me become the the, the man that I am or the athlete that I am today right. nice <clears throat> now going from talking about struggling to early on I remember vividly you guys were playing in Rupp Arena and Russ hadn't really played much and coach throws Russ Smith into the game Russ Smith comes out first shot he hits a from the left wing, I remember, hits a bank shot three-pointer. And that's, that sparked the legend right there. Because from that point on, Russ Smith went on to become an All-American. So when you look back at it, what would you say more so contributed to your success into becoming an All-American from your early struggles? Man, I, I think it was my, uh, I think it was my background. I had nothing to lose, you know, like it was, it's, it's weird, you know, when you have nothing to lose and you're just, you just out there playing. Cause it's, <laughs> it's like, if you take me out, I'm back where I was at. <laughs> facts, so, facts. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like, I think that was the, um, I think that that's what it was, honestly. Um, Cause I had to just leave it all on the floor at, at, at that point in time uh, because it, it couldn't get any worse than it was going to get if I was out of the game. Um, and then that's what I did. Um, that's what I was doing to those guys in, in practice. Once I got inserted in, uh, I would try to run it up as fast as possible as I can because I know I'd be coming right back <laughs> out. <laughs> so um it actually worked. I mean um but it was it was one of those weeks where I was just I was playing pretty well and I was rolling and um I mean we it was like three games before that I think coach and got on um Chris Smith about something and it was because the way I was guarding him in practice and Chris got mad at me. Um, and I ended up starting versus Memphis. I had a phenomenal game. And then we played Georgetown at home. I had a solid game. Um, and I think we lost. But then we played Western Kentucky. 
the following. I had a great game. Uh, it was the Minardi Classic, I think. And uh, I, I think I got MVP of that. Then we got to Kentucky. And I had a great Kentucky game. But I didn't think that I would play against Kentucky. Like, that was the game where it was like, oh, you went too far. Good luck and ran out. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so after that, after that game, um, it was – it, it kind of the everybody kind of wanted me to play, and um, I put a lot of pressure on coach. I put a lot of pressure on the assistant coaches, and then from there, um, Ralph Willard was a close friend of coaches, still is. I had somebody that was in that coaching group that brought me in, that now gives them reason to fight for me. You know, like. Because every coach, every player has that coach on the staff that brought them in. And that's what I was up against. I was up against everybody's guy. And so when I'm out there right. playing um, and I'm playing well, now, like, all of the, the fans and now the media, because it, it didn't become, you know, Rick Pitino and the Louisville Cardinals at that point. Like, on ESPN, I, I remember vividly, it would, be, it would say my name. And I was passed out in the room. And all my friends were going crazy. So – from a media standpoint, I never really experienced all of everybody on my side. And that was the the, the, the biggest difference in, in going forward after that game on CBS at noon. Um, I was just um, one of those players that now you had to play and everybody was waiting to see. And it was, it was tough, but um, it was a lot of fun. Russ, talk to us uh, about the key points into the national championship run. Like, what was some of the key points and, you know, what, what did y'all have to do to get to the national championship? Man, um, it was, well, besides, man, like, the in that, on that championship run, it was that year we felt like we were supposed to win it. And so it was fun playing. Um, and we, we lost the – we lost like three straight and each game that we lost was different. So that's, that's what kind of helped us. Um, we lost one earlier to Duke with Gorgie in play. So we didn't really count that. We knew we can beat those guys. Um, but three games in the middle of the year, it was a little turmoil. Um, and we couldn't figure it out. Uh, and we had to get the, the kinks out, um, whether it be if a team plays us this way, or, you know, if we have to trust certain plays or just, just, you know, basketball stuff. And then uh, we lost the six OT game on the Notre Dame. Um, I, I, that really, that, that helped us because it tested, um, you know, our mental stability. We have to, we have to close games. Um, and that's what was, because we were always up, we were always winning. So when the games got close, we had to figure out a way to close them. And I think those four losses, um, was a test was a testament to that going into the Syracuse championship game and then going into the final four because we were down both times but we've been there before um, on the road you know against Georgetown against Villanova um, at Notre Dame we've gotten the court stormed on us three times that year that should, that was crazy <laughs> and um, so going into that final four, uh, we was already battle tested in that aspect. We've gotten stormed on three times. We've been in seven overtime games. Um, we've had we've coached and changed the lineup a bunch of times. So even in a championship, when I didn't go back out to start, nobody threw a fit. I didn't throw a fit. Um, it was just like that had to be done. Um, there were things that had to be done in the middle of the season, and. That's and that's what it, and that's what it takes to to win. You have to just make adjustments on the fly. I was talking to a group of little kids about that the other day. Like the best thing you want to do is as an athlete is to always get exposed early. Like the the more you get exposed, you know, the more you get to see the chinks in your armor and 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 the, and the more adjustments you're gonna have to learn to make on the fly. And I'm a big believer in that. So if I'm not getting exposed, then I'm not getting exposed enough. That's always been my mentality. Right, right. And let me <laughs> congratulate you too, man. I never got to congratulate you in person for breaking my record, man, on scoring the most points in a half. So <laughs> I definitely want to congratulate <laughs> you on that, man. And uh, well, well deserved from one score to another, man. Uh, no, definitely no. congratulations on that. <laughs> uh, but after after U of L, you won your national championship. You get drafted. 
by the Philadelphia 76ers, but then you're traded to the New Orleans Pelicans. Right. From the time you get drafted, what is the coach, what is the organization, what are they talking to you and what are they telling your agent about the plans that they have with you or what they see with you going forward? Man, um, like, I swear, I, 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 get, I always get so emotional when those questions, when those type of questions come up because it's so, it was so much that um, I wasn't ready for. And, you know, when I was at school, um, I, I told you guys about the, uh, the teaspoon of the, the business that I got. But from my sophomore to my senior year, that fix already been burnt out. So I totally almost forgot, you know, almost what I went through my freshman year, early my sophomore year, after two and a half years of just riding a high. So when I got when I got to the to the Pelicans, Drew Holiday's on contract year. Tyreek Evans is on contract year. Austin Rivers is on contract year. Eric Gordon's on contract year. Everybody's on contract year. And then it's me and Jimmy for that <laughs> as well. Like kind of kind of just the you know taking the hit because everybody's on contract year, so they love me like New Orleans love me. Um, I'm still great friends with the Dems, and um, it, it had nothing to do with the the organization. That everybody it was fine. The, what what I got caught into was politics. The, part, the politics. Um, they didn't want to renew. They didn't want to give Austin Rivers an extension. But Austin Rivers is Doc Rivers' son, and uh, a first round lottery pick. So you have to play Austin Rivers 20 to 25 minutes. You have to build his value up. Eric Gordon was a guy that was playing 30 games a year. They wanted to trade him. So you got to play him, show, and he has to play every game at least 25, 30 minutes to show that he's healthy, he can sustain the season, and you want to build his value up. Tyreek Evans, you want to trade him, you got to play him to build his value up. There was no minutes for me there. And, um, and then we had a head coach that Monty Williams, great dude, um, one of the one of the most amazing men I've met in my life. Um, just spiritual, a lot of values. He he was on the hot seat at that point, so he was looking to play his vets and play the guys that they wanted to trade. And it was I, I couldn't I couldn't find the court uh, at all. So uh, <laughs> Anthony Anthony Davis is still a good friend of mine. I had some uh, good vets in that team. John Simons was a good homie, um, it, and um, I met uh, Dante Cunningham. Um, I remember he he was in the Big East. I used to watch him, so it was cool. We had a we had a cool little um, a cool locker room, man. Um, uh, Lexi Ajinxa, and um, then I got and then after the Pelicans, um, they traded me. They threw me in a trade, and I don't even think they had to. Uh, Memphis um, requested me in that trade, so I kind of just had a bad. I kind of got had a bad a bad hand um, over New Orleans, but I don't think I had anything to do with that. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about since you said it, a little bit about your uh, experience in Memphis, um, G League, yeah. uh, one point game. Then when you was overseas, averaging sixty one. Talk to us a little bit about you know those things, and you know when you get to talking about the eighty one point game, um, how did you feel that morning? Yeah, in the game, <laughs> it was, it was, um, uh, man, uh, it was a I, well. I'm gonna start off with Memphis. Um, Memphis was amazing um, because I met so many great people that I that I watched. Um, I watched Vince Carter, you know, watched Zach Randolph when he was with Portland and the Knicks, and then um, I was on a team with uh Mike Conley. Mike Conley's one of the smartest players I've ever played uh, played with, um, ever. Um, and court, I was on the team with the, uh, you know, Courtney Lee and, and Mark. So there was a much older, mature team. Um, at that time, Memphis was playing the slowest pace in the NBA. I was still one of the premier, fastest up and down guards um, in the NBA, um, or for my class, so to speak. So I couldn't, I couldn't make the adjustment. Um, to, to play in Memphis. And that's what it came down to. New Orleans played half court, um, half court ball movement offense, and Memphis did the same, uh, but it was even slower. Um, so I get sent down to the G League frequent. But what I never understood was um, all my summer leagues, I dominated my summer leagues. I led summer leagues and assists twice, and I won a summer league championship with Memphis. 
Um, so after that, I thought, you know, I would stay. And there was a lot of front office uh, friction in Memphis. That organization was very weird. Um, basically, um, uh, it was like what John Morant is doing with that team. Memphis had a lot of opportunities to have those teams. So a lot of people died for John Morant to walk in Memphis, so to speak. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of, and they finally got it together there, like um, over there. But um, after I got released uh, from there, went down to D-League, I was obviously pretty pissed off and pretty upset. And I started um, killing everybody. I think I was leading the league in scoring coming off the bench. Uh, in the D-League. Uh, our team was loaded. Earl Clark, Jordan McCray. Uh, we had Rodney Carney and um, Sean Kilpatrick, Christian Wood. And I was coming off the bench, averaging 31 a game. Um, so we did, uh, I got a G-League record um, that year, 65. Um, then I went to a G-League camp, uh, averaged 23 at the camp. The next leading score was averaging 14 or 15. And then I did a summer summer league with Portland. That went awful. Uh, had to, yeah. I was it was it was a lot, man. Um, that went awful. I, it was it was a lot of punches it took. Um, we we thought that my agent thought that there was an open spot there, and I was going to be the starting guard the whole summer league. They made a trade. Now all of a sudden, somebody else is on contract. So me on the summer league team didn't matter. And um, had to play through that, played through it, thought I was finished. Uh, it didn't go well. Next thing you know, I get a big offer from Galatasaray, a huge offer. It's EuroLeague. I'm like, I'm about to just leave the States all in all. I'm going to go to Europe. They rocking with me over there. They, they cutting me the check. I'm over there. So I get to Europe. Little that I know, it's, you know, it's the same, kind of the same shit, different toilet, but even worse. It's even, it's even a, a worse toilet. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the damn, uh, damn coach, you know, kind of drags me through the mud, drags me through the media. I become the fall guy. Um, the agent, there's an agent that represents nine of our players on my Europe team. Including Welcome the to coach. being the American overseas, brother. Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, that, I'm that fall guy. I'm the guy. So um, yeah, yeah. So I had to. I didn't want to breach any of my contracts. So there was a lot of things that I was doing over there that that was in kind of inhumane. Like I mean, I would wake up at seven o'clock to get a workout in. Those guys wouldn't write me back to to let me know what time was my workout so I can miss it and I can get fined. Um, then I had a workout at seven, workout at one, another workout at seven or eight again. I was doing that for weeks straight, um, not knowing the dresses there to, to meet workouts, almost getting tricked into drug tests that weren't really drug tests. <laughs> like it was bad. So uh, I'm glad I left that situation. And after that, I wanted to stop basketball, wanted to quit. Um, yeah, I was ready to just pack it up. and. And then after that, I uh, talked to my dad, went back to the D-League to continue playing, continue hooping, finished out well, got a little deal in China for the summer. And that's kind of where I found my peace at, fellas. Like, it's been kind of uphill ever since uh, besides the, the injuries. But the, I'm, I don't even wor worry about injuries. Um, like, the game is, you know, 90% mental, 10% physical. Like, if I can move my – if I can recover, then I'm cool. <laughs> but uh, China was good. Um, that that season went average sixty one points per game. That is a world record, most points ever averaged in a professional league in season. And the game I had eighty one points. I think that was about five games in, six games in. I was like, yeah, I think I can average fifty a game here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first game, I'm like, I had sixty something. I'm like, I could probably average forty here. That's cool. But after the 80-point game, I was like, for sure, 50. Then there was a point where I got about five straight 70-point games. And I was like, man, it went from going from 53 games to like 56 to like 58 to 59. And I'm like, holy shit, 
I can average 60. So <laughs> and then, and then uh, all of my teammates were, uh, they were like, they started pushing me to get there. We had a couple of easy games toward the end of the schedule. So they were, they would definitely look out for me. If they had a layup, they'll get it to me on the break. But we were good though. We finished second place in the league or third place in the league. And everybody was happy. We, they was projected to be like last. Uh, so it was a good season. Then I went to the CBA and um, performed well in the CBA. Top three in points, assists, and efficiency. And it doesn't get better. And then since there, I've just been rolling. And um, my name has been relevant in the positive matter in basketball. So Now, you just recently signed. Where are you going to play at this year? So I'm going back to the CBA. This is the first time I'm nice. going back to the CBA since um, my injury. That was crazy. I, um, and so it's it's I've I've worked very hard in the last year and a half, and it's finally good to see my hard work pay back off. So nice. Now you're into a lot of different things. Like we said at the beginning of the podcast, you're into bourbon. You rap. You do music. You got songs with Jada Kiss, Lil Wayne, and many other artists. You're into a uh, new movie. You have a new movie coming out. You do a, you're very active in the community. Talk about some of the other ventures that you're into as well. I think my greatest um, ventures and my best adventures are all of my humanitarian acts. Um, we, I partnered with um, the New York City Police Department to raise awareness on injustice. I think it's important that uh, a, lot of, a lot of Black and urban communities um, and police and people in the police department just understand each other and and have a better understanding of each other. And police need to realize that you know we're we're human too, and you just you just don't understand us, and you have to understand us. It's your job. And I've done things with I've partnered with the police department here and put together a good foundation event for Officer Nick Rodman, um, and now. Just recently um, with Breonna Taylor, um, I partnered with Metro um, City and um, the parks and um, her law firm. And we've gotten a, a court done in her in her honor to raise awareness on social injustice. So I'm a big believer in social injustice. And that's the humanitarian side of my foundation. That's what we do. We've done a lot more things. But um, besides that, I've heavily into music, um, work with Jada Kiss, I work with Lou B, um, the writer of uh, Nappy Roots, you guys know uh, Still. Um, and then I've also was a uh, featured artist on the track with Davies, Lil Wayne, and now I'm working on um, uh, a deal with uh, Fabulous now as we speak, so I'm gonna try and get that done. The Jada Kiss video is gonna drop, it's in my movie, it's, it's my movie soundtrack. So there's parts of my movie in the video. So um, it's just been nice. a unique experience and uh, we rolling. 